Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with us using the chat box. We'd also like it if you would sign up for the latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. In today's episode, we're talking about flying cars, the case for advanced air mobility. Flying cars, buses, trucks, and taxis, from the Jetsons to Star Wars, advanced air mobility vehicles, or AAM vehicles, are one of the more exciting prospects of living in a futuristic world. Today, we listen to Emily Kadima talk to experts Chris Lawson and Depashis Badra about how this may become a reality sooner than you think. Chris Lawson is a principal engineer at Aerospace. He leads cross-divisional projects focused on using machine learning, natural language, deep learning, artificial intelligence, and big data to solve acquisition-related problems. Depasha Spadra is a senior economist with the Office of Aviation Policy and Plans at the Federal Aviation Administration. He's responsible for quantitative modeling and forecasting of aviation activities and research related to the integration of unmanned aerial systems into national airspace. Our host, Emily Kadima, is part of the technical staff in Aerospace's Technology Data Science Department. She researches the business, system, and technology development of unmanned aerial systems. Over to Emily to get us started. Thank you, Rebecca. So I'm joined here today with Depashas. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. As well as Chris, thank you very much for joining. My pleasure, Emily. Thanks for having me. So AAM is a very new technology that, you know, could change the way that we view transportation. Uh, before, you know, you may have sat in hours and hours of traffic trying to get to, you know, the nearest beach or perhaps running late to make your flight and, and really just getting out of a hard day's worth of work, trying to go home, sitting in, in bumper to bumper traffic. Well, just imagine that you could perhaps fly over all that, zoom to your location, and, and get there in a matter of minutes as opposed to waiting in traffic. Um, so that's kind of the story behind advanced air mobility and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, Depashas, can you start us off by explaining a little bit about what is advanced air mobility? Sure. Uh, let's uh, advanced air mobility, or oftentimes it is uh, called AAM. Uh, let's define it what it is and what does it do. So what it is, is that it's a, it's a aircraft. Uh, in most cases, uh, it is uh, primarily led by battery powered electric propulsion system. So it takes off and lands uh, in many cases uh, vertically. So that's why it's called EVTOL or electric vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, and some of them also have short takeoff and landing some of them have conventional takeoff and landing but primarily uh, it is a vehicle that is led by battery power electric propulsion system and it roughly uh, flies around somewhere between 50 to 150 miles so it connects uh, to adjacent cities it transport transports people from uh, residents to work it transports people for a restaurant visit in the evening or taking you to a concert or in some cases it uh, takes a patient from their house to the nearest hospital and so on so these are the type of activities that they are involved in so i think i defined what it is and what does it do in this uh, definition thank you for that description it seems that there are a lot of different use cases for these vehicles, ranging from uh, air medical, cargo, and really just passenger use. So just absolutely amazing that we'll be able to see that in the very near future. Uh, Chris, so we recently, Aerospace did a research uh, project with the FAA. Can you tell us a little bit about those goals that we had? Absolutely, thank you, Emily. Um, so to, to build off of 
what Tapas has previously was, you know, discussing with AM, you know, there's a large number of potential use cases. And so, you know, I think those of us that were, you know, children of the, the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we grew up loving the Jetsons and seeing flying cars. You know, part of AM rather, you know, is an extension to just the wonderfulness of the technology and just how spectacular it is, is it's a real economic boom. Right. So if you if you think about it, you know, being able to support things like, you know, like air cargo, right, or last mile delivery of packages, you know, it creates these, you know, tremendous economic efficiencies into into our infrastructure. And so part of what aerospace was tasked to do was to, you know, take the technology and, you know, understand where it was going to move, how it was going to progress and then, you know, kind of help understand what sorts of economic opportunities it would afford. So the analysis revolved around that. So, you know, we did everything from going through and, you know, qualifying, you know, a couple of select, you know, our key use cases, understanding where the technology was going to help, you know, and when, and then, you know, beginning to quantify and characterize what that, uh, you know, economic boon looks like, you know, all for the purposes of, you know, helping our value customer FBA, you know, help inform their decision making. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, it seems that aerospace has done a lot of work in these areas. And I know that we've done a couple of iterations of this project, each building on the previous. Um, so as a result of all of aerospace's studies with FAA, um, it's led to a number of different policy and regulation changes within FAA, including, you know, beyond visual line of sight, uh, nighttime operations, operations over people, et cetera. Uh, Chris, how do you think these new rule changes with the FAA will affect the advanced air mobility industry? Well, I think they're going to be a tremendous help. Um, and I think also, mm -hmm. in addition to the policy changes, I think, you know, um, programs that FAA was, you know, undertaking, you know, on their own as well, you know, from, you know, uh, different types of certification, you know, as well as to, you know, some of the different types of experiments that they're running, you know, with select number of, um, you know, operators, um, it's really kind of pushing the, the envelope. And so, you know, I think really what it comes down to when you're looking at, you know, a measure of goodness, if you will, for, for AM, is it's the idea of letting technology help, right? So one of the biggest costs or bigger costs, I should say, underlying AM are, are labor, right? You know, pilots cost money, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, guidance, you know, kind of helps fundy, you know, inspection, all of that stuff. So. If there is a way to leverage um, technology, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, to automate to some extent some of those tasks, not only do you affect cost savings, you know, you also improve the bottom line. And so at the end of the day, really what that translates into is, you know, sort of improved margins. Um, that really helps close the business case for a lot of these startups. And it really, you know, shows the upward growth uh, of market potential, you know, of, of the segment. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, Dipasha, from the a FAA's perspective, how do these rule changes kind of change the game of advanced air mobility? Well, that's a very, very uh, important question, Emily. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, there are many aspects of it uh, that I can uh, discuss, but I'm going to focus on a, on a particular issue that uh, aerospace corporations work really led us into the path of looking at uh, uh, the software uh, automation, right? When you look at the software automation, and as Chris described, that there is a tremendous amount of uh, use of artificial intelligence, machine learning. So it is, it is a tremendous uh, productivity enhancing for the agency, as well as opens up the doors for uh, exploding. Uh, many different ways to understand a new vehicle. And it's not only the new vehicle, but also the vehicles uh, in use uh, different type of functionality, as I mentioned before. So it allows us to understand that envelope uh, even better. So, so these are some of the uh, applications, I would say. Right. Yes, I believe there are a lot of different applications, but with new technology, new applications, there tends to be a lot of a lot of hurdles we need to run over and jump over to get to where we want to be. Um, Chris, what do you suspect might be the biggest technology policy or public acceptance hurdles AEM has to overcome to be viable uh, for us to to see this, you know, in the skies, hopefully in the near future? Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Emily. Um, 
you know, I have to say it's AI, it's autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. If you look back in the history of technology, oftentimes what you see is technology tends to outpace, you know, where policy is, right? So, you know, for instance, if you go back to, you know, World War One, you know, we developed the bomb without thinking, you know, what's the impact of proliferation going to be? And, you know, the development of the transistor led to this, you know, incredible ecosystem and infrastructure and compute capabilities that, you know, I think the researchers themselves, you know, hadn't foreseen. But if you look back at history, where it was used and how it was used was was heavily regulated. Um, you know, I think with artificial intelligence, there's a certain trust factor, um, right? And it's, I think it happens in any endeavor where you have, you know, sort of a, a well-honed and developed skill set with a very strong culture behind that and piloting is no exception to rely and trust a machine to kind of perform those, those critical and I would say very safety centric functions. Um, you know, I, I think it takes time. Um, but I think also there's an openness that, you know, you find now to test it, right? Let's perform an operational experiment. Let's develop a set of criteria to see how well it does, you know? And I think certainly it's one of these things where over time that, that hurdle or that resistance, you know, to allowing to some degree, you know, a piece of software, you know, or a, a black box, if you will, you know, help take over to some extent some of those mission critical functions. I think it's just a natural path. And we're seeing this across in, in different industries. You know, we're seeing it in, you know, marketing, we're seeing it in autonomous driving. I think AM is going to be no exception. Right, I agree. There are a lot of different hurdles, and, and you've mentioned a lot of great ones. Um, Sebastian, do you think the FA would agree with that? Well, you know, FA is a um, is a safety as a safety regulator. Uh, FA uh, has to really be slow in that process. Of, as Chris uh, mentioned, that it's a it's a slow emergence and. You know, our way of uh, bringing in new technology is to make sure that we have tested every piece of that technology to our best satisfaction so that safety of flying public is guaranteed. So it will follow that path, but it will, as uh, Chris mentioned, that uh, most likely the technology will outpace the policy, which is in a way is good because it gives us enough time to understand the, uh, the maturity path of the technology. So I would say that yes, uh, but it's a cautionary yes, that it's a process would be rather slow uh, from what I have seen by studying the aviation industry as a whole. Right, and I think you bring up a good point that technology is just changing almost at lightning speed. You know, it's different from today or tomorrow or even six months from now. Um, so what exactly is the federal and local government doing to prepare for these changes um, to the national airspace, uh, Dabashas? Oh, that's a, that's a, you know, very good question. And uh, it may actually take uh, much, much longer uh, time to discuss, but I'm going to highlight a few uh, uh, places where uh, federal government as well as local and communities are really uh, gearing up to uh, facilitate the advanced air mobility, which is also known as AAM. Uh, first of all, um, you know, NASA uh, is uh, really been in the forefront of doing many of the research uh, uh, that is kind of testing out uh, the vehicle's performance, doing lots of uh, uh, flight testing uh, in order to understand uh, how well this machine performs. And as we are doing this, we are also realizing that we would need a new set of infrastructure because these are urban vehicles that are flying taxis that will need a place to land. So therefore we need uh, the physical infrastructure, which are known as body port or body pad, or even using the parking garages. So the NASA uh, has a campaign called National Campaign that uh, NASA has been conducting flight testing and recently signed on uh, different partners to participate, both from private sector. And NASA has also brought in 
a lot of uh, at least five or six uh, different state and local communities into the discussion and FA is a very active participant in that national campaign. Within the FA, we have a what we call as a, a, a focal a discussion every month. We have a, a discussion of what has been discussed at NASA and what are the immediate implications in terms of FA's implementation of AAM. Uh, so we work hand in hand with NASA as well as DOT and the state DOTs, uh, the Department of Transportation, in order to uh, not only understand the, the marketability, their economic potential, their physical infrastructure, airspace coordination, and all of these things are, are being summarized and put together in terms of what we call a CONOPS paper, concept of operations paper, and that FA has, uh, has published uh, one in last June uh, in 2020, and NASA has a similar document a little bit further into the future is NASA's AM CONOPS. So these are the, uh, the documents that summarizing what, are, what is the present state of uh, affairs and what needs to happen in order to make these things, uh, make this vehicle feasible in the near future. And we are actively working with, uh, as I said, uh, five or six uh, local and state communities. So there is a great deal of activities that's going on in the, in the, within the government sector, both federal and uh, local. Thank you, Dipashas. Uh, Chris, so Dipashas had mentioned uh, about Berta ports and how that infrastructure system would be need to set up. How do you think that we would be able to best go about that? Well, that's that's a great question, and uh, let me take a step back and uh, you know ask a, a counter question to uh, to Pashas. So, you know, really, what you're getting at, you know, beyond just infrastructure, is if you look at the entire ecosystem, you're looking at a system of partnerships. You know, not just between FAA and operators, but manufacturers and providers, and you know, boy, there's just this whole big ecosystem of, of software. You know, developers they're just eager to you know sort of you know, crack into this and, and, and help, you know, um, you know, fill a large number of potential use cases that have a lot of potential. So I guess, you know, the question to you, Dipashis, is, you know, how does FAA kind of regard that, you know, that system of partnerships, you know, if you will, and what is FAA doing to promote those partnerships, you know, across industry, across government? Oh, that's that's a uh, that's a great question, and I think it's fundamental for the success of the sector. Is that let's let's break it into a couple of pieces. Example, for example, if you look at the uh, physical infrastructure that will be needed, in in other words, where you will have those vehicles land and take off from, you will need physical infrastructure all across the country, right now. A, a, a similar a reference to a similar kind of infrastructure is existing helipad, right? If you look at where the helipads are, you will find there's roughly about 6,000 helipads scattered all across the country. Now, some of these helipads can be used uh, for um, uh, advanced air mobility type transportation, but a, a great deal of new infrastructure, and those are the once I'm calling as party port or party pad, will have to be built. And FA cannot really get into the business of building those infrastructures. So therefore, FA will have to do partnership with the local uh, communities and the state and local governments in order to promote that. And how does FA promote that? FA puts together what is known as advisory circular and FA is working towards putting an advisory circle where FA lays out what are the technical requirements, what are the power requirements, what are the structural requirements that will accommodate these new vehicles and then passes on that advisory circulars to the local communities and the private sectors who are willing to develop those infrastructure. So that's uh, an example of how FA is working with the local communities. If you look at uh, other areas, for example, 
uh, airspace, right? Uh, airspace is an FAA's uh, business, very direct business, how to manage and control. But what FA has realized that actually the private sector and what we call as, uh, as the private sector operators who, who are going to be in charge of managing that part of the airspace uh, which will be uh, cleared by the FA, but will be managed and uh, all the traffic within those corridors. So FA is working with, uh, with uh, those uh, uh, traffic management companies or in, in, in FA's lingo or in traffic management lingo is called, uh, uh, is called PSUs, I forget the exact uh, exact abbreviation, but those are the types of uh, partnership that FA is putting together, which will facilitate the entry of these uh, advanced air mobility vehicles in the system. I think that's fantastic. Thank you, and I, uh, if I could just follow on really quick, Emily, I think, you know, if you look at one of the, the true values, at least for me, of, of AAM, is it's really about connecting communities. I mean, that's sort of the, the critical enabler. And uh, I think in a sense, it's poetic that in order to connect communities, you have to have connections and partnerships across industry and government. And that's just fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so Chris, on the, on the flip side of that coin, um, we do have, of course, you know, the government side that deals with infrastructure, partnerships, um, rules and regulations. Um, but on the other side, we do have venture capital and private industry. Um, what, did, what do you think that they're doing to facilitate uh, advanced air mobility's entry into the marketplace? Well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I think it's a couple of things. Uh, but before I get into that, let me take a step back and, uh, you know, from, you know, my, my vantage point, um, you know, maybe discuss a little bit about how venture capital works. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when they're looking at, you know, ways to allocate capital, you know, they, they want to see, you know, one, I think a value add, but I think also that, you know, they want to see return. Um, you know, if, if you look across, you know, the, the history of, of AAM, you know, this has taken place in, you know, maybe a few places and, you know, it's been maybe niche, right? So certainly from the point of view of technology development, you know, there's been some really focused pockets of investment whether you're talking about the vehicles themselves or the software, um, you know, but maybe a little less kind of across the, you know, so the, the infrastructure, you know, uh, domain and bounds, as it were. Um, I think that that's potentially changing. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you kind of a couple of reasons why. Um, one of the things I think that's happened since COVID is sort of the nature of work, you know, the, the nature of commuting has, has shifted a little bit. And I think, you know, VCs and startups and small companies are seeing AM solves a lot of really practical problems. I think what's going on now is, you know, that, that real due diligence to understand how that can be monetized and how that can scale. Um, and it does require lots of investment, but as Deposhis was saying, through the form of, you know, public private partnerships, you know, through issuance of grants, you know, through issuance of credits. I mean, fiscally, that becomes a lot more feasible. And I think it's something that's generated interest. Leaving VCs aside, um, there's another part of this, which is looking at, you know, the larger, you know, blue chips, if you will. Um, there's considerable advancement in, you know, those individual um, research arms. You know, if you think about what Amazon's doing for AM, if you think about Joby, you know, there's a number of other companies, um, you know, Uber, you know, has a 40% stake <laughs> and a couple of companies that are kind of central to this. Um, you know, from that end, you know, they do see the market potential in this and they're making those, you know, those investments, you know, to, to have sort of that, that long stale stake in, into the market. You know, oftentimes what you'll see, and you've seen this with the analytics market as well, is you'll see certain islands group around those use cases that they might consider low hanging fruit. Um, over time, you know, those tend to proliferate and there's secondary benefits. You know, for instance, if you're looking at delivering packages, right? 
you know, one of the other things that you can do is, hey, collect data on traffic, you know, while these birds are flying out. And if you make that service available, that's a secondary revenue stream. And, you know, these companies are very smart at, at realizing these opportunities. And they're also very smart at monetizing that as well. So that attracts a lot of interest, both internally and externally. And I want to throw in one more thought. One more thought to it is that if you look at the way the investment is taking place, uh, there's a lot of lot of excitement uh, in the uh, private market. Not only a, a, a horizontal collaboration across different sectors, but also a vertical uh, collaboration within the airline company uh, that may provide enough funds for these companies to be successful in the marketplace. Right, and uh, as you said before, it's it's across various sectors. It's um, not just passenger, not just medical, not just cargo. Some of the things that we've discussed before, but it's it's across many. Um, so, Deposhis, of those or any other ones that you may know of, which do you think are probably the most promising that we can expect to see sometime soon? You know, the two that I have, uh, my personal favorites, I don't know why, but I think the two my, of my personal favorites, one is the air ambulance, uh, which is um, kind of a, a, an area that may complement the existing helicopter transportation, but in some time, it may actually substitute the helicopter transportation, uh, the transportation of blood across different medical campuses. So, so air ambulance is a, is a, is a huge area. Uh, airport shuttle uh, is an area that I think uh, has a great deal of potential. And then you have the air taxi within, the, within an urban suburban complexes, uh, followed by uh, the AR Metro, which is, uh, as Chris mentioned, of uh, allowing you to commute between your place of work uh, to your residence, uh, that may emerge somewhat differently after the pandemic is over in a, in a year or two. Right, and I think most people can picture themselves going in, a, in a, their own personal, you know, AAM, traveling from here to a vacation, to work, to a friend's house. Um, but Chris, would you agree that some of those are the more promising uh, uses? I agree. Um, and I think to, you know, um, add on to what Tapash has said, I, in my mind, I, you know, have a little bit of a, of a, of a boundary there, um, which is there are some use cases that are squarely public goods, you know, sort of facing, right? So I think certainly air ambulance is one and there's a huge boon to society, you know, that, you know, if that were to actualize and, and grow in an appreciable form, you know, that that's extremely useful. You know, I, I think also for me, you know, kind of addition to those, you know, sort of passenger centric, you know, use cases, um, I think air cargo, you know, almost as its own category, I think is a, is a really kind of key um, use case for the being that if you do apply autonomy related technologies and you can increase frequency of shipment, um, you know, in essence, you've lowered shipping costs, you know, and other things that kind of relate to the purchase of goods and services. That has tremendous economic benefits, uh, potentially. And I think that that's something that for the good of society, that would be a very key use case, not to mention the fact that there's lots of companies that, you know, recognize that and are actively pursuing that. And I want to just jump in that so much, so true, that if you look at the sector as a whole, and you see the amount of money cargo is also stands to benefit tremendously from the overall logistics uh, chain in the country. And I think too, with the advancement of air cargo, you know, another benefit is there's a lot of rules of thumb, you know, a lot of operational tribal knowledge that they can gain that could be applied to other use cases as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a one versus other. I think it's a one, you know, kind of bit and fitting many. And um, it's, a, it's a very exciting space. And I'm just very grateful that we Aerospace have had a chance to, to work with our partners in FAA. Um, we've learned a lot and I think it's been, you know, a, a great path. So have we. So have we. Right. And in regards to cargo, the way we're doing it now, it seems that 
you know, due to the pandemic and other other reasons, we, there seems to be a backlog and a little bit of challenges trying to get that cargo here in a, in a timely and efficient manner. Um, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the AAM market in, in other similar ways that it has to, to the cargo and shipping market now? You know, if you look at, for example, if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the recent uh, inflationary pressure that we are experiencing in some areas, now those uh, people have studied them and found out that a large part of those inflationary pressure build up uh, that we observed over the last six months or so have been due to uh, the obstacles in the logistic chains. Now, if you have uh, the uh, automated uh, air cargo delivery by a large U.S., that might actually relieve some of those uh, pressure and we might uh, have a better adjustment in terms of supply and demand would have a better adjustment because we are introducing a flexible system uh, that is extremely efficient and more capable within two, 300 uh, miles range. Now, if we take a look at the air transport, I mean, the passenger transportation side, uh, that we have to wait and see because what we are experiencing now based on different surveys, based on market analysis, studies of households, that 25% uh, or even 30% of folks that used to be working in person may not uh, uh, return to work in person. They may choose to have remote work. Now, that in metro areas may actually reduce some of the commuting congestion. And now that may have some implication on the passenger-centric urban uh, air mobility and that's something, you know, we'll have to wait and see how uh, the operators and the passengers uh, adjust to this new reality once we come out of the uh, out of pandemic. And Chris, do you suspect there will be similar impacts due to the pandemic? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think perhaps, and I also think it's kind of hard to say, um, let me add a little bit to what Deposh has uh, said, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with everything. Um, you know, the supply shocks, you know, are this unattended consequence that I don't think anyone really foresaw, you know, um, arising from the pandemic, at least to the, the degree that it did. Um, there are these, you know, sort of long-term, you know, shortages that just, you know, are dynamic and you know they seemingly appear out of nowhere and you know that it really kind of shifts the whole supply demand cycle um, what that means is that potentially has a negative impact on cash flows you know for a variety of different companies now leaving that aside for a second if you look at commercial aviation you know a lot of the shocks that were experienced early on in the pandemic you know had a fairly significant impact on the discretionary spend so a lot of these, you know, growth um, areas that they were investing in, you know, I think were, were impacted. Um, you know, I think that that sense, you know, equalized a little bit. Now there's a pro and a con to that, right? So oftentimes when you're entering a new market, you know, one thing that you'll do um, is you'll look at, you know, a number of different ways that you can generate cash flow, and then you'll spread a little money here and there you know, and kind of see which one, you know, kind of ultimately is going to give you the, the the best gateway there. I think what COVID did is I think it focused almost like a laser beam, a couple of core use cases where companies can make profit. And I think that there's been a little bit of a shift that way. Um, taking a step back, one of the reasons I mentioned supply chain is, you know, as we all know, there's a silicone shortage and there's, you know, other shortages mm -hmm. of, of goods and materials. Um, these companies, you know, or I should say the manufacturers of vehicles, you know, they rely on a lot of the same parts, right? So where that begins to be, you know, uh, a factor is when these companies look to scale, right? So from their long-term growth plans and, you know, their cash flow estimates and kind of when they do their break-even analysis, it's going to potentially affect all of that. Um, now, there are different ways that that could be offset, you know, with other types of influx of capital, you know, VCs like we mentioned. But, 
you know, I think for a few, the decision calculus has changed. One of the other things that you kind of see happening as a result of that is that it's a tremendous opportunity, you know, for other, how shall I say, larger companies that are looking to gain entry in the space. You know, by putting that capital investment down, you know, they're essentially setting themselves up for long-term acquisition. What it essentially means is that the nature of how the market evolves, you know, is going to change over time. So, uh, short uh, answer at the end um, is I think COVID had a fairly significant impact, and we're probably going to see, you know, the consequences play out more over the couple of years. I think long-term, I think it's going to be a solid market and I think that there's going to be a lot of value, a lot of jobs, you know, a lot of really great things that arise from it. I think the the nature how that, you know, evolves is perhaps going to be a little different than we thought it was a year and a half ago, but I, I still think it's going to be a very good story when it's all said and done. Very much. Right. I believe every story has its, uh, its bumps and challenges it needs to get over. Um, you brought up a good point that uh, the supply chain has really been backed up. And as you mentioned, silicone and other materials needed for AEM have really, you know, become in short supply and, and trying to get those materials has become fairly difficult. Um, Debashis, what would you say that industry leaders are doing to address some of these challenges? You know, uh, I mean, I, I totally, I think uh, Chris brought up a very good points and you also bring up a very good point. Uh, what the industry leaders are doing is that uh, is that they are addressing they have like uh, multiple tasks so they have a market oriented task uh, where uh, they would like to promote these vehicles as a means of as a very very much of a viable means of transportation on the back end they will have to also make sure that the manufacturing process and uh, type certification process, uh, meet the uh, safety standards. So in both areas, uh, they are constantly uh, coordinating with uh, the, the government agencies, for example, all the all the operator manufacturer that, uh, that we work with, they're working very closely with FA in terms of making sure that their vehicles are well tested and uh, very safe and therefore they will be uh, certified properly and and looking forward when they work with say nasa and fa and other cap other capacities they're also scouting out the market making sure that they understand the market well and and they can prioritize which market they can serve and along that way they're also looking at in terms of the financial sector, making sure that they raise enough capital that can match their uh, their, their their financial resource needs. So the the industry leaders are doing a, a multi-dimensional task, and they're doing extremely well, as you can see how well it is progressing. And as uh, Chris mentioned, that eventually these bottlenecks that uh, have arisen due to uh, the supply chain logistics, these will be addressed and these will, these obstacles will be addressed and eventually we will and our, our great hope that by 2024 to 2025, we will see the new market begin to open up and thanks to all the hard work of the private industry and their leaders, uh, this is progressing uh, rather smoothly. Right. So there seems to be a lot of challenges, not just with the supply side, but also getting back to that uh, regulations and rules side. Do you think that these uh, new changes will affect that in any way? Uh, I I do not know. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a kind of a new reality right now. Uh, the agency is in the process of understanding the vehicles, uh, so so I do not expect that's going to happen. But uh, you know, as as we learn more information, as we get to know these vehicles through flight testing, uh, we have more information coming. 
And Chris, do you think that some of those, uh, or what do you think might be the, the biggest hurdles that they have to kind of get over in order for um, for them to get through all these new policies and regulations? Well, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, I let me give, you know, two answers to that. Um, you know, I think with any large scale infrastructure, you know, uh, challenge slash opportunity, because it really is both, um, you have a fundamental challenge of stakeholder alignment, right? So aligning interests of, you know, various different parties, you know, whether it's commercial, you know, whether it's, you know, governmental, regulatory, and kind of so on. And so I think being able to do that in this context and clearly articulating the the win-win, I, I think is a challenge. I think it's also something that FAA is doing extremely well. Um, I think that there's also another challenge, and this applies, I think, across the board, whether we're talking, you know, tech, we're talking commercial aviation, you know, we're talking, you know, government, is tribal knowledge can be institutionalized, right? And to saying, okay, so this is this is kind of how we do things, right? Um, when you have the advent of new technology, which has, you know, promise of being able to do things that hitherto have, have just been dreamed, you know, like the, the Jetsons metaphor, you know, it in a sense requires different um, stakeholders to kind of confront that that identity, right, that they, they built up from tribal knowledge and say there's a core kernel of this that we need to, to keep with, but there might be some some elements of that we need to change, right? And I think that nowhere is that more acute than policy and regulations that, you know, kind of surround AI. Um, I'm not saying that just because I'm, I'm an artificial intelligence, you know, data scientist. I, I think that it's a profoundly disruptive technology that is coming to bear much faster than anyone thought. And I think it requires, you know, a, a boots on, you know, top up, or I'm sorry, bottoms up, assessment of these regulate regulations of these policies and being able to have that real forward look to say this is honest to god where the technology is going to be here's what it can do here's what we can do to balance a lot of things you know safety economic growth um as well as market entry right thank you for that all right so now on to the most serious question of the show uh if you were to ride in an AM, would you just be a passenger or would you like to fly it? And if so, where would you go? <laughs> I would rather be a passenger, honestly, because I never had a, uh, acquired my pilot license. So I feel more comfortable to be on the professional scent and fly around uh, Los Angeles, for example, you know, just to see, say, see the city span and the beautiful skyline. How about you, Chris? Neither. I'm an engineer. I want to build it. <laughs> it's a good workaround. <laughs> there you go. I think I'd rather be a passenger for the, the same reason the flash just said. Just go and enjoy the views. Yep. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for, for joining us today and, and sharing a little bit of your knowledge that you have on advanced air mobility. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Depashas. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you to our expert guests for giving us something to think about when it comes to using AAM vehicles, maybe sooner rather than later. And thank you to our fabulous production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bam. Check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show and sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Be sure to look for our podcasts and share your favorite episodes with colleagues. We look forward to having you tune in to our next episode of the Space Policy Show, and until then, take care.